if you assume any rate of improvement at all, um, then the games will become indistinguishable from reality. Is the universe a computer game? Are we just dancing puppets, obeying the laws of some computer out there in the universe? Is everything basically a fake? So now you lay out all these universes and throw a dart. Which of these universes are you most likely to hit? The original one that started it, or the countless simulations folded thereafter? And the third possibility is that we are almost certainly living in a simulation. Detailed enough that the simulated people in these simulations would be conscious. Hello world. Some of the most brilliant minds we have right now thinks we probably live inside a simulation. They think there's a strong possibility that the universe around us is a software construct. We're going to return to that, but first I want to get this out of the way. Even though this is a very interesting and exciting thought, even someday they prove that we really do live inside a galactic simulation or we live a 100% analog reality, nothing changes. It does not have any effect on our lives in any way, other than rethinking of some belief systems and creating some existential shifts. Yes, we all gonna start thinking, who am I really? But on my part, I do that already. And me being a pragmatic person to the point of being shallow, so what? There is something much more exciting than that and we're all slowly going to that direction. But first, let's understand what this simulated reality is. This is explained by many people in detail many times, so I'm just going to go over them quickly. Nick Bostrom suggested at his book, Are You Living in a Computer Simulation? that our reality might be a simulation of an unknown entity inside a computer software or something similar. Which basically means there's a possibility that we all live inside Matrix. And there are some interesting facts pointing to that direction. Quantum physics, for example. The strange behavior of particles at the quantum level, like superposition and entanglement, makes some wonder if it's all just a code in a simulation. At the quantum level, particles behave in a way that are very different from how they behave in normal world. For example, quantum particles can be in multiple states at the same time, which is called superposition, and can be linked together in such a way that they share the same faith, even they are separated by a large distance, called entanglement. Basically, in the micro world of atoms and particles, things get a bit mind-bending. Particles can exist as one, zero, or both, one and zero simultaneously. Imagine flipping a coin in our everyday world. It is either heads or tails. But in quantum realm, that coin can be heads, tails, or a surreal blend of both. That's called superposition. Now picture taking another quantum coin and linking them together. Regardless of how apart they are, when you flip one, its fate determines the other. If it's heads on one, it's heads on the other, like cosmic twins. This phenomenon is known as entanglement. And yes, particles indeed behave this way, much like bits inside a simulation. And there's the Mandela effect. It's all about collective unexplained false memories. Back in 2009, Paranormal researcher Fiona Broom attended a conference where she realized that a significant number of people shared her memory of Nelson Mandela dying in prison during the 1980s. Some even remembered watching his funeral on TV. However, the former South African president was released from prison in 1990 and was very much alive during that conference. There are many different theories about what causes the Mandela effect but there's no scientific consensus. Some people believe that it's caused by a glitch in the matrix or a shift in the multiverse. Others believe that it's simply a case of false memories which can be caused by a number of factors such as suggestion, imagination, and passage of time. There are lots of examples of Mandela effect. Like, many people remember the Monopoly man having a monocle, but he has never had one. Or many people, including me, remember the famous line of Star Wars as being Luke, I am your father, but the actual line is No, I am your father. 
or many people remember the line from Snow White as being mirror mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all. But the actual line is magic mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of one all. Then there's deja vu. Deja vu is that eerie feeling when you think, wait, I've totally been here and done this before. Some people believe that deja vu could be a glitch or a moment when the simulation repeats itself, making us feel like we're experiencing something twice. Scientists try to explain this as it is about the way our brain processes information. It is suggested that during deja vu, there may be a momentary delay or glitch in the way information is sent to brain's memory centers. So, when we experience a situation, it feels like we encountered it before because our brain's memory system temporarily misfires. Another idea is that deja vu happens when our brain's memory retrieval process gets mixed up. Instead of recalling a past memory properly, it gets misfiled as a new experience, creating that strange feeling of familiarity. But even those mainstream science arguments looks like it's just a software glitch. I think one of the most convincing things about simulation theory is the laws of physics as we know them. Imagine you're looking at a beautiful painting and you notice that every detail, every color and every shape seems to follow a perfect pattern or rule. It is as if the painting was created with incredible precision. Instead of random emotional influence, it is designed with specific laws and rules. When scientists study our universe, they find that everything in it, from the way planets move to the behavior of light, can be described using complex mathematical rules and equations. These rules work incredibly well and consistently, just like a perfectly designed computer program. Some math professors even said, it is like we're not inventing. We're exploiting what is already there. So, some people wonder if the universe following these precise mathematical laws suggests that it might have been intentionally designed, much like how a computer program is meticulously crafted. It's like finding the fingerprints of a designer in the beauty of the cosmos. Some people see this as evidence of God, just like people see the thunder and think the same thing. And some sees this as a construct, set of predefined rules to govern a complex system, just like a simulation. So, do we live inside a simulation? Maybe. Does this affect our lives? No. Our actions have real consequences. Living in a simulation or in a base reality makes zero change in choices we make. We still get hungry, angry, sleepy. The things we do and their effects on us and people around us are perfectly real. And that is reality in every sense of the word, simulated or not. Now, let's talk about the exciting part we mentioned at the beginning. The possibility to live inside a simulation that we create, we control, where our actions have no consequences in the world we really live. Possibility to create a world without hunger or sickness or death and live in it free of any social or physical rule. This is what we look for. This is what we try to do. Let me tell you the story of BR5RB. The battle of BR5RB, or the bloodbath of BR5RB, started when Havoc Corporation, which is a part of Nolai Seconda, which is a part of N3 Pandemic Legion Coalition, forget to make a security payment to Concord about a station rent at the system BR5RB. This resulted Concord, being the galactic lawmakers founded by all the governing forces of the galaxy, dropped the sovereign status of the station, which meant others could claim the system and everything in it, including the station and the giant Titan-class battleships and dreadnoughts inside its hangars. An enemy scout discovered Noli Secunda quietly attempting to regain control within their territorial claim units. At 1400 UTC, with an hour remaining before Nolai Seconda could gain control, the CFC and Russian coalition sent a capital fleet to the station. The arriving fleet stopped the reclaiming process of Nolai Seconda. 
that resulted N3 and Pandemic Legion deploying their carrier and supercarrier fleets in their famous Wrecking Ball formation to overwhelm the CFC and Russian Federation and take back the system. As retaliation, CFC and Russian coalition deployed their entire capital fleet to the system. Meanwhile, they deployed their subcapital fleets to N3 staging systems to delay the reinforcements. Battles started with some minor salvos and quickly escalated to tighten the Titan showdown. Two sides traded Titan kills almost every hour. Their doomsday weapons hellish beam glowed again and again and the system became filled with carcasses of once mighty ships. There were no rescue, no salvaging. Warp disruption bubbles made that impossible. For a while, neither side gained any real advantage. Though, CFC Russian coalition managed to activate their territorial claim units and held a slight lead in the number of enemy titans destroyed. During the engagement, the battle's effects spread across the entire universe, as fleets tried to block reinforcements, destroy fleeing capital ships, and ambush pilots attempting to enter the system. Battle lasted 22 hours. Over 7,500 actual people participated in the overall battle. 717 corporations and 55 alliances lost 75 Titans, 13 supercarriers, 370 dreadnoughts, and 123 carriers. More than 3,000 small and medium ships and uncountable number of drones perished at BR-5RB. And there were all real people. The total loss was near 11 trillion ISK, which converts to more than $300,000. And after CFC and Russian coalition defeated N3 and Pandemic Legion, people logged off. One minute, they were in an epic conflict, looking down the barrel of a Titan-class battleship. Next, they were going to work in a public transportation or struggling at the everlasting city traffic. No one participated remember this as, I was in my room looking at my computer screen. They all remember this as, I joined the fast response squadron as soon as I heard the call and we all warped into hell. This is the ultimate escape from our normal daily lives. We create simulations that we randomly beat people and take their cars. We create simulations that we fly spaceships through asteroid belts and mine minerals to sell them to buy better ships. We even create simulations that we live a perfectly normal life, buying household and going to work. We create all kinds of simulations about war, space, fantasy worlds and simple human interactions. We choose how we look in them. We choose what to be in them and we reveal our true selves inside them, good or bad. Then we simply log off and go about our day like nothing happened. And the technology gets better and better about putting us inside those simulations. We started with some analog controls to sophisticated headsets to virtual reality accessories. They're getting better and they're getting cheaper every year. The technology and social tendency point to the direction of being able to dive into different worlds and make them as realistic as we can. Soon, we will be able to put ourselves inside those worlds completely. It seems we really want to live inside our own special worlds that we create for us and people who share the same ideas and fantasies. Clearly, this is what we want. But what then? How are we going to be able to just log off when we live the life of our dreams and desires and step back into normal lives? At Star Trek New Generation, when I see the holodeck for the first time, my mind was blown. It was love at the first sight. I don't remember I wanted to have something that much since then. Creating worlds of our choosing and living inside them with that level of reality was unimaginably amazing. Then I realized there was no possible way I would leave it and get back to whatever real life I was in. Living the world that I create or living my full of responsibility, boring, painful life, it wasn't even a choice. And even writers of the Star Trek recognized this. There was the serious problem called holodeck addiction, but 
I also remember that I thought exactly the same thing when I see my first space simulation. Thankfully, things didn't happen as I thought they would, and I was able to adapt and regulate. But there is also another, more dangerous problem. After spending hours inside a complete sensory input-capable simulation, are we going to be able to adapt to the real world, where our actions have sometimes serious consequences? What if we play as a man who can fly inside a holodeck-level simulation for 10 hours straight, then just return to our lives? Are we going to be able to remember that we're not logged in anymore? And do something really, really stupid just because we're confused? I can think of much horrible examples about hurting people around, but I'm not even going to go there. Unfortunately, if we have holodeck rooms in our future, we all know things like that are going to happen. They're going to be a serious minority, hopefully while 99% of us enjoying the amazing worlds we simulated. Like everything in life, there are some advantages and pitfalls of this concept. The virtual reality is being used at troop exercises, pilot and astronaut training, and even in medical science. I believe we will find a way to adapt to this technology and learn to live responsibly with it. While some computer-created characters inside our perfect simulations think are we living inside a simulation? If you listen to me this far, thank you. Take care of yourselves, calm down, and stay safe. Goodbye for now.